everyone, and welcome to Behind the Curtain for our upcoming world premiere of Art is a Verb. My name is Pablo Siquedos. I am the Public Programs Associate Director. And normally when we do a Behind the Curtain uh, in a regular uh, season, uh, we usually have some sort of uh, lecture style uh, learning environment. Um, obviously this season has been a bit different than we normally do things. Um, so we're finding new and unique ways to uh, introduce educational components to each of our offerings. Um, so today, talking about art is a verb uh, is Karen Quisenberry. Uh, she will tell us a little bit about what it is that she does at the opera. Um, and then we'll get to talking about art as a verb and what makes this uh, work kind of unique uh, and how it will fit into uh, our upcoming virtual benefit. Uh, so welcome, Karen. How are you? Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm well, thank you. Um, I'm at home today, which has been different for me. I've been mostly working uh, at the Opera Center. I'm one of the lucky few that uh, kind of gets to be in the building doing work. So, But today I'm at home. A little bit better internet right now at home. Nice, nice. How are you recovering from the recent... Uh, polar vortex, negative 17 degree weather. <laughs> I am ready for it to be a little bit warmer. Even today, it's a little bit warmer and it just feels better. It feels more comforting. I'm ready to be outside again on a more regular basis, so right. yeah. And for anyone who is watching this not from Minnesota, when we say warmer, it's 10 degrees outside. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's not 20 below and that's that the part true. that's that better. <laughs> So Karen, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is that, that you do at the opera, what your role entails, mm -hmm. uh, so that we can kind of get a, a, a picture of, of the perspective that you'll bring into this conversation. Definitely. Um, my, again, my name is Karen Quisenberry. I, got, I go by the pronouns of uh, she, her, and I am the pro I, I am the vice president of production, which is a, a fancier name for production director. Um, but really my job is as the production director at Minnesota Opera. I oversee all of the production elements that when you come to see an opera or when you experience a, a piece that we put out there now virtually, I help to bring all of that together with a really great team of people uh, in, in my department. So I oversee the scene shop, costume shop, stage management, sound, audio, video, lighting. Um, gosh, what else? Uh, that's, that's kind of the core and my I'm, you know props falls under uh, the scene shop. So uh, all of those kind of tangible elements that you see in a production, whatever costume someone's wearing, whatever wig they're wearing, what they're interacting with, if it's if they're making a drink on stage, where those bartending uh, pieces came from, even the piece of furniture that that's sitting on, all of that, my team has worked with a, a different group of people uh, as far as the designers and the directors to envision that and bring that to life. And uh, it's a it's a it's an exciting position. It's uh, it's a challenging position. It's particularly more challenging in uh, COVID because we yeah. are hands-on people. So right, right, and we can't have hands-on anything, right? <laughs> correct, correct. You know, and to move large pieces of things, it takes multiple bodies to do that. So we've completely kind of had to rethink. So in the world of COVID, part of what I've had to also take on is that. Uh, the COVID planning also falls in production. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we're the ones that take care of the singers and take care of their interaction and- uh, And you're and way more organized than we are. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be super organized and we, we try to be as organized as possible. Um, outside of that kind of stuff that people see, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of my job is about calendars, I build all the calendars for the company and I build them up to a certain point and then I hand them off to uh, either the assistant production director or the production stage manager and then they fill in even more specificity and detail mm -hmm. from what I hand off to them. I do a lot of negotiation for contracts and I do a lot of matchmaking, which may be one of my favorite jobs is uh, I, um, 
thinking about a show, working uh, with Ryan Taylor and Preeti Gandhi on who will be the director of a production. Mm -hmm. And then once we figure out who that is, I, I work with them to determine who the designers will be. And, uh, and you really are trying to put together the right kind of personality, the right kind of artistic sensibility for the piece that we're trying to do and really uh, have everybody be thinking about all of our initiatives at, at Minnesota Opera uh, with regards to anti-racism, anti-oppression, how it affects the show that we're doing so that we're all really kind of guiding our way to a production that the audience will see, uh, but the matchmaking is a really fun part of my job. I also do a lot of budgeting and uh, I work with numbers a lot, which is strange for me. It's not my strong suit. That's not what I planned on doing, but uh, I work with a lot of numbers and uh, and try to try to put all of that jigsaw puzzle together all the time as far as cost and human resources. So what you're saying is it's, it's a very simple position. It's yeah, incredibly simple. I get a lot of sleep. <laughs> uh, I, um, you know, I, I don't like have to stare at my computer for hours on end sometimes. I, I will say my technical director, Josh Peclo, actually said to me yesterday, because uh, we just completed filming on Art as a Verb, and he's like, you know, because it has been a year of a lot of budgeting and moving money around and mm -hmm. how can we do this? And he just said, you're, you're a, a, a lot more fun in the rehearsal room than you are when you're budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I know, because I love that. I do love that. I love that part of my job of being in the room and watching things come together and seeing how we can do that. Well, even just hearing you talk about all the different components of the things that you oversee or that you're directly involved in, like those could all, those, those are all individual jobs. So how, how does one kind of come to a position like yours? You know, it, it's, it's been an interesting journey. I started as an actor. Um, so many, many I years. I didn't that. You didn't know that? Yeah. I didn't know that. I have my undergraduate degree is in acting and uh, but uh, I, I, I grew up in Texas and in Texas um, I went to a junior college there at majoring in acting and or majoring in theater but my goal was to be an actor and I've acted through junior high and high school and uh, and I loved it uh, and then after I got my associate's degree, I ended up going to Southern Utah University and mm -hmm. continuing for two years uh, with the goal of my acting degree with a theater major. And in my senior year, they made me stage manage a show. And I was incredibly angry with the faculty because I did not want to do that. And we were doing Octet Bridge Club, which was an all-female cast. And I really, really wanted to be in that show. And I was like, how is it that you can deprive me from playing that show? And uh, they made me stage manage Christmas Carol. And I was like, no. But I did it. And everything just clicked for me. And, and I was like, oh, you know, years later, when you look back, you're like, oh, they knew what they were doing, those crazy educators. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I stage managed that show. And then when I think back, when I was at junior college, because it was a small school, small program, uh, you know, I did a show, I did a um, uh, Mary Wives of Windsor, where I played Mistress Quickly, but I also ran the sound and I did live sound <laughs> and I rang chimes and I pl pl did reel to reel because that was back in the reel to reel days. Yeah, when yeah. I'd, run, I'd scurry off stage and character and run over to the sound operation and do that. And there was another show that I did props for and was also in. And I was like, it all kind of started to make sense that. Mm. Um, maybe really the stage management path was a better path for me. Yeah. So once I stage managed, um, I, I did decide that I might try and go to grad school for stage management. Um, and, uh, but I would also try to go in acting and having a stage managed only one show, I got accepted to three different schools in stage management and I got accepted to no schools in acting. So I was like, mm -hmm. perhaps that's a sign. I also grew to love the idea that in the arts that stage management was, a, was an art form, art craft. I look at it as an art form, but that stage management was an art form that 
required skill. You know, not that acting doesn't require skill, but acting is so subjective. It's about what the casting director or the director want. What do you look like? You know, sure. what do you sound like? And stage management, if you could do that, you get the job, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that made much more sense to me. Yeah. Um, so I went to graduate school in California, at the University of California, Irvine in stage management. Mm -hmm. It was their first class of stage managers. Um, and I was the only one who had, I had the least amount of stage management experience, um, but it was a great opportunity for me. And I just loved it uh, because, uh, because we had to do everything because we were the first and only incoming class. And then as other classes came in after us, uh, it got easier, but I just was on all hands on deck kind of thing. And so I did three years there. And in the process of that, I, we, we stage managed dance, theater and music events, um, both like concert hall type events, recitals, that kind of thing, as well as uh, some opera. And then, we, uh, and then we had an internship that we could take and they would still give us our assistantship. And I ended up taking an internship at Seattle Repertory Theater in my third year of my MFA program. And, mm. uh, and then the next fall, I was hired as an equity assistant stage manager at Seattle Rep. And so I, so I moved to Seattle. I worked at Seattle Rep for seven seasons. And uh, in the summers, I would stage manage for Seattle Opera. And that was, uh, I, would, I would say that's where my interest in opera came from. Mm -hmm. I had met a singer my my third year of school there at, at Irvine and, uh -huh. and we ended up getting married and I kind of figured I needed to know a little bit about what his <laughs> career was that he was pursuing. Gotta show we're no longer, right? We're no longer married, but we um I'm still in opera. So yeah. <laughs> that part has gone really well. <laughs> um, but I think what I what all of that taught me was that. I really love putting all the pieces together and, mm -hmm. and stage management is the incredibly focused detailed part of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I really thrived on, in doing that. Uh, after seven years in Seattle, I ended up uh, going to teach at Yale University at the Yale School of Drama. Mm -hmm. And I was really, because I was the production stage manager there and teaching, I usually stage managed one or two shows a season, but I was able to pull back and really watch the work and participate from a higher level. And I started to gain a better understanding of production directing and, uh, and what it meant to be a production manager and the scope of that work. And uh, so it's all kind of threaded together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I will say that for me, I, I did not come from means of, uh, in any way. And it, part of my goal was to always go to school wherever, wherever it was paid for, you know, wherever I could get a scholarship, that kind of thing. And I was fortunate enough to, to be able to have all of those uh, experiences um, through, through scholarships and grants and, mm -hmm. and get the education that I, that I got it, with, at really great places that maybe weren't like necessarily on the radar for different reasons yeah but were really great collaborative collective environments of wonderful artists who have kind of all gone on to really different and varied careers that's awesome yeah um so shifting gears a little bit to art as a verb specifically um the reason why i i thought it would be a good idea to, to talk with you about this is because Normally, we're talking with the people who either create the work or are like very hands on in the process. And I feel like your perspective can be a, maybe a little zoomed out, um, even though you were, you were very much in the process of the, of the creation as well. Um, I thought your, your perspective could, could be really interesting. So how did, how did this idea of art is a verb come about? The idea really came about uh, through our uh, our gala committee that is a part of our board of directors. And as they were really struggling with what are we going to do in this time, mm -hmm. this time of COVID, 
in this time of Minneapolis and civil unrest and the reckoning that we're all going through uh, in, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. and, and what that has brought into the industry as to how we work with singers and performers, uh, black singers and performers of color and, and other artists in the industry and what stories do they have to tell in this time that, that will help us better relate to what we're going through and help us set the course for change and how we want to do things differently. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the, you know, so it couldn't just be your regular gala. And in light of that, uh, Ryan and uh, Preeti and, and Lee Bynum, our vice president of impact, we were all talking about what could this be? And we just, we were batting around the idea of you know, I mean, what what if like Sydney Outlaw and Karen Slack, these performers that we've grown to love and admire, what if they just kind of told their story? And uh, I said, because they're incredibly charismatic and engaging, and I think people would just be swept away by them. And then that just kind of grew into who could we add to that mix? How could we shape this and what that that led us to was bringing in Harrison Rivers, who is a local playwright here in Minneapolis, uh, who is, so his work has been really incredible. I've seen a lot of his work at Penumbra and, um, and helping him, we had been in conversation with him about some librettist work before, but uh, just allowing him to work with us, you know, or not allowing him to work with us, allowing him, allowing us to work with him as we kind of figured out what kind of story we wanted to tell. We ended up uh, uh, bringing on four performers, uh, Andres Acosta, um, Andy Wilkowski, who lives here in Minneapolis, um, Sydney Outlaw and Karen Slack. And the four of them, Harrison began to work with the four of them on creating these stories, asking them different questions and asking them to write down the answers. I got super excited as we were talking about this and developing this. Um, after I left Yale, I ended up uh, as the production director and uh, the chair of stage management and the chair of the design program at the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And one of my jobs at Cranert Center for the Performing Arts, which is where all of that is housed, was the direct as a, as the director of new work. And I did a lot of new work with artists such as Ralph Lemon, B.B. Miller, Michael Rouse, Carol Armitage, these incredible performing artists uh, that of course are kind of stuck in a category of, oh, they're a choreographer and it's dance or, or sure. they're a performance artist, that kind of thing. But, but the work that they were doing was really unique. And uh, I also worked with a company called uh, Builders Association, which uh, is based in Brooklyn. And what all of these companies were doing, and, and it was what is now termed devised work. And mm -hmm. it means everybody is a collaborator in the process, that the work comes from everyone in the room. And that device, it's not something that opera has really kind of grabbed right. onto. Because right? <laughs> opera is hard, you know? Opera, opera <laughs> is just like you've got a composer or a librettist, you, and I've done a number of our new uh, new works here, our new operas here at Minnesota Opera, and it's, you know, it is incredibly complex. And it's a you long know. process, too. It's a long process, yeah. When we do a full-size opera, it takes us three to five years to complete that process, yeah. and, and... So what, what has this timeline been? This timeline has been very, very <laughs> truncated. Um, we started talking about this probably... I want to say like September, October, right after Opera in the Outfield. And uh, and the singers and Harrison got together in uh, late November, mid-late November, and they started feeding him information back uh, in early December. And we kind of had our first read through in early December. And then Harrison worked with them some more and he did, he did some adjusting and we had another read through at the end of December. Uh, and uh, and that's really fast. In the meantime, Preeti mm -hmm. had hired uh, B.E. Boykin, uh, Brittany Boykin, who is a, a composer, and she started putting some of this to music. 
And her contribution is really, I think, like 13 to 15 minutes of music. And mm -hmm. the singers have also picked uh, songs that are very personal to them, that are more well-known. And um, uh, some of which are operatic, some of which are not, uh, but, but, but songs that, that mean something to them. And so, so there's that music as well, but that also had to be arranged for them so that you know, it's in their key yeah. and they're able to, to uh, present it in a, in a really confident and comfortable way where they can share their passion about that piece. And so all of that's happened in the last two and a half to three months. Wow. Which so is that crazy. versus three to five years. Yeah, versus three to five years. A very short amount of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very short amount of time. So, so that's been really fun and interesting. And I think we've learned a lot about how can we do this? Uh-huh. Uh, you know, and I think this, the, everybody that's been involved is, you know, I think, you know, knowing what we know now, there are things that we might do differently. Mm -hmm. And then you, but then you throw in the, the other added bonus that we're not doing this for the stage. We're doing this to right. be filmed. And, and that again is a whole different perspective. And, you know, and the singers in this piece are actually not only singing, but telling their story. And they're not used to talking a lot on stage. They <laughs> sing a lot on stage and they're incredible yeah. at it. And they're good at the talking too, but it's like, how do we make them feel comfortable? You know, and then you have to kind of pull back and go, oh, but we're filming it. We, mm -hmm. we have opportunity here to kind of break that up a little bit so that it, it, you don't have to kind of go from, you know, A to Z in one take all the time. We did end up actually doing a lot of takes that were from A to Z because it made sense. And that was a through line for them that was comfortable. But but just giving ourselves that little bit of cushion or that little bit of comfort zone to know that, yeah, we can just do this in this little moment uh, and we'll do it again and we'll do it again and we'll do it again and we'll do it again. We'll do it again. Um, so it is different. It's different to kind of put ourselves out there in that way um, mm -hmm. because it's just not 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 a world that we're overly familiar with. You know, we're familiar with storytelling, but we're familiar with storytelling from the stage. And, yeah. uh, you know, and I, I really very much applaud them for their hard work in, in, in realizing this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, singers are so used to playing characters on stage, not necessarily themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can imagine that's a really, people are gonna get a really unique uh, story coming through. Yeah, uh, that is very specific to the people that are telling it. For um, sure, and the dramaturgy of that is them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, sort of the the physical setup of how our normal rehearsal room, which sometimes will contain you know set pieces or things like that while we're rehearsing, what does that room currently look like? <laughs> <laughs> very, 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 very different. Um, I mean, we, we've focused everything all towards one end of our rehearsal room. Um, as far as lighting, we've had to install a fair amount of lighting, a, a truss of lighting, as well as a scaffold that has lighting on it and a projector. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we still created settings for each of the, each of the performer's stories. But in the filming of that, you know, it kind of just got closer and closer and closer. You know, you're bringing in a lot of light very close up to really frame them in that mm -hmm. space. And uh, so I think that was a bit of an adjustment for all of us in production because we are so used to looking at the right. big picture. Right? We're used to performers looking like this tiny from the back of the theater. Yeah. It's so different. And uh, and so, so we really had to kind of work in a more intimate way while still keeping COVID in mind. You know, our intimacy mm -hmm. was a little bit limited, but, um, but we were very thoughtful about when they stayed masked, when they took the masks off, how we positioned things around that. Mm -hmm. And we only had one singer in, a, in the room at a time. Yeah. which which was also a little bit challenging, I think, for the storytelling. I think that that that's a challenge. And one of the other challenges is 
is the mask. You know, you're wearing masks. We're all wearing masks. The communication is more difficult because your sound is stopping right here. Right. You know, and um, and but they're wearing masks, and as you're working with them, you're missing those beautiful and interesting facial expressions that yep. they have. And so when they would take the masks off, it's like, oh, wow. there's your face. <laughs> your face right? That's that's the other part of the story that you're yeah. telling, you know, that you're sharing with us. And we don't typically get to kind of experience them in mm -hmm. so intimately. So that's been great. Yeah. So when when viewers watch this show, kind of what what is this going to sort of look like? I mean, you kind of mentioned there's some newly composed music, some existing music that's been sort of arranged for the specific uh, performers. Ultimately, what what does the final product kind of look like? Well, I'm excited to know. Um, <laughs> that, that's that's the other new part of like kind of approaching a project this way is that I was on the phone with the editor today. And, uh, you know, of course, when people see this starting on the 27th of February, um, it, it, it will be a piece. It will be a 35 to 40 minute piece. I don't know exactly how long it is yet um, because it hasn't been edited together. Uh, but ideally, um, ideally, we're able to take these four performers stories and piece it together in the way that Harrison uh, created the, the libretto and that we visually kind of get to see them share these stories, share these stories about their lives, about their past, their histories, about their hopes for the future of the industry. Mm -hmm their hopes for, and, and the challenges that all of them have faced just emotionally um, as, as they've been having to work from home and not be in spaces with people and the challenges that they've had to face when that homework was disrupted by the murder of George Floyd and the reaction to that. And, uh, and, and I, think, I think the audience will experience just kind of this beautiful but brief journey of of each of them that then takes us to this place of, of, of where we hope to go, of where they hope to go and how they hope to contribute to, to what we do in a very actionable way. Hence the title, Art as a Verb, which is uh, kind of part of, a, a, is, is a riff off of a James Baldwin quote, but mm -hmm you know, it really does bring into focus that art is a verb. You think of art as this static thing. It is not a static thing. It has motion, it has energy, and it has the possibility for change. Yeah. I mean, that makes me think, I recently did a, an interview with one of our resident artists, Alan Michael Jones, and he said something similar in that um, I was asking about what the role of art is in response to world events. Um, such as the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And he said something along those, I'm paraphrasing. He said something like, art allows us to share a message in a way that people will hear it, mm -hmm. which I thought was really powerful. Yeah. Um, yes. And and that is, I mean, that's exactly what, what this is, it sounds like. It is, it is. And uh, I think I think the end product, we're going to be extraordinarily proud of it. We're already extraordinarily proud of it. And, uh, you know, and, and now we're just piecing it all together uh, uh, from the many video tracks that we took and the many audio tracks that we took and uh, filming it in our rehearsal room and also filming it in a rehearsal room in New York. And uh, actually yesterday we were talking about the, about crediting and, and how do we do that? And I said, well, I think we need, you know, a Minneapolis location crediting listing and a New York location crediting listing. And mm -hmm. Carrie Masick, our, uh, our assistant uh, production director, she was just like, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? <laughs> and we had multiple locations uh -huh. on our shoot. And I was like, we're like a real movie, but <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it it has really kind of taken us on a on a on a fascinating journey um, right. in how to present our work from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Or like how um, 
Carrie has, I don't know if it's a sticker or something that says Minnesota Opera East. Yes. Yeah. She's, she's in Philadelphia now. Yes. I think we should yeah. just have a second campus in the East Coast. <laughs> I know, and was a saving grace for us in this moment because we did have to film a segment in New York and that she could go from Philadelphia to New York when all the rest of us were like, we're staying in Minneapolis. Yeah, right now. yeah. So, so that, that worked to our advantage, um, but... Uh, but yeah, you know, and, and that's and that's different too. That right now we're all kind of able to work from from all these different places. Yeah. So you know, obviously we're also coming out of uh, the release of the four miniatures operas, mm -hmm. and then taking on this immediately after, all of which were processes that were so different from how we normally approach uh, productions or new works. Um, what, what do you think this means for kind of the future of opera or the future of productions? Is there room for this once we go back to in-person, you think? I think so. I think, uh, I think especially for something like miniatures, uh, which was, is, so, is so unique and gives us an insight into how, how we share our stories through music in so many different ways and from so many different cultures and, and what can be the germination of a new work. Um, I think there's a, a lot to be had there. I do think, yes, something like art as a verb is, is it really important. I feel that if we could do that in front of people and on stage, I think it's that much more impactful. Sure. You know, getting to be one of the people who gets to be in the room, of which I know I am a lucky few, mm -hmm. um, for them, you know, to hear Andy, Andy Acosta saying somewhere over the rainbow mm -hmm. in this incredibly impassioned way. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it did make me long for the stage. Yeah. You know, and I, yeah. I, that is one of the great things about my job is that I get to be in the room with when all this happens. Yeah. And uh, not, not to quote Hamilton. Or not anything. to quite quote Hel Hamilton. <laughs> that is my life. Uh, but, um, but I think last week just kind of affirmed how much we miss that. Yeah. Um, because it is really, it's incredibly powerful and, and the gift that they are able to share uh, is when it's live and in person is really special. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a balancing act, I think, of, of what we kind of put together for film and what we continue to put together for a live audience. Yeah. Exciting changes. We're adapting. We're mm -hmm. trying to go with the flow and making the most of what we have. So. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, but I do, you know, when I watched all the miniatures, I was just like, oh, they're just, they're these little jewels that, uh, you know, that we thought we were going to have to mine for, and we didn't have to mine for them at all. They were just yeah. waiting to be picked up, you know, yeah. and there's thousands of those out there, I think, for us to work with and play with and get to know and understand better. And that's incredibly exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, is there anything else that you would like audiences to kind of know uh, before Art as a Verb uh, on the 27th? You know, I, I would just say, take it in, enjoy it and think about how you see art and you see the world and how opera, how it affects you and what, mm -hmm. what your experience is with opera and what you hope your experience with opera will be in the future. I think that's just gonna be, that's part of it. And, yeah. and it, is, it is a moment to be incredibly reflective and to be incredibly uh, motivated. Hmm. Yeah, reflected and, and motivated. I like mm -hmm. that. Well, Karen, thank you so much for uh, taking a little bit of time to chat with me about art is a verb. Um, it's certainly making me look forward to it uh, even more than I already was. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll 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 kind of wrap things up and um, 
yeah, can't wait to see this on the 27th. Thanks Me again. Either. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care.